Hello, and welcome to the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. That's HSTI podcast. I'm your host, Tom Brady, the Associate Dean and Director of the Homeland Security Training Institute here at College of DuPage. And every time we do a podcast, we talk about different events, different security measures, different areas of Homeland Security, because we want people out there listening to be as safe as they possibly can. And today we have a very interesting show. We're going to be talking about unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, with Joe Adusi, who works for Argonne National Laboratory, but he's also a faculty member here at the College of DuPage. Joe, how are you? I'm well, Tom. Thanks for having me today. Well, we're thrilled to have you in the studio. You know, you and I have known each other for, for quite some time. But why don't you tell the people listening uh, what you do, tell a little bit about yourself and, and what you do with Argonne and at College of DuPage. Sure. So at uh, Argonne National Laboratory, we're a Department of uh, Energy Laboratory located right outside Chicago, Illinois. Um and I'm in the Global Science and Securities Division, and I'm in the Risk and Infrastructure Science Center. In that center, I'm the manager of the National Security Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, as we call it. And uh, that's what I teach here at the college as well. I uh, instruct in the uh, geography department, and I uh, am the uh, primary instructor for the GIS certificate program we have here at the college. Yeah, and it's a fantastic program, Joe. I know I know a lot about it. Why don't you tell people a little bit about, you know, what, what GIS is and what it does? So, sure. So, uh, GIS is Geographic Information Systems, and basically it's a mapping system. It's computerized mapping systems. But we like to think of it as more than just a cartographic product. What we do is we take information and data and make it spatial, meaning we place it on the map for analytical purposes. So one of my uh, models I like to uh, talk about my class, one of my, my themes is that we turn information into uh, data, into information, into intelligence for the decision-making process. So it can be anything from agriculture to urban planning to national homeland security. We take information and make it spatial, which is a great tie-in to the um, unmanned aerial systems that we uh, work with both at the college here and at the laboratory. It's everything we do with that aircraft is spatial, and it's a great uh, connection point between the two disciplines. And really, everything that you do with GIS, uh, UAVs, a lot of it has to do with with homeland security, with with protection, um, and making sure that people are safe. Let's get into specifics about UAVs. Um, a lot of people call them drones. Is there any difference between the two? <laughs> so the uh, the term drone, we uh, we try we tend to stay away from the term uh, drones and use UAS, unmanned aerial systems, or unmanned aerial vehicles, because drones, in a sense, have a very negative connotation from uh, from the military. People. Uh, place a negative uh, thought on those, thinking that they're going to have missiles on them, that they're going to be used um, to uh, impede on rights, possibly. But they're really used for a large amount of uh, activities in the civilian sector and the military and government sector as well. But most of them are pretty, very benign, actually. They're actually used for good things, such as planning, such as agriculture, um, precision uh, agriculture mapping, um, multispectral cameras, infrared cameras on those, um, is tank inspections engineering firms are using them beyond uh, what we ever thought they'd be using them for. You know, it's interesting you talk about the negative connotation because I was watching a a news uh, report which was on uh, YouTube last week about UAVs. I was doing some research for, for classes that we're going to be offering here at the college. And it was really interesting to me because it was a, a look at using UAVs for public safety. And the thing that struck me me about that interview was the the anchor or the reporter said at the end of the story she said well it's good to hear drones being used for something positive and I thought well, that's kind of weird to me because I didn't really con have the connotation that it was drones were negative but to your point I guess I guess in some people's minds, they think of it as, as something uh, that can be very dangerous. Well, and, and that's, that's a more recent phenomena, too, that they've been uh, more commonplace because, quite honestly, where you think of UAVs, UASs, and drones have started was with the, with the military. Right. And they were used for reconnaissance, the predator-type uh, drones, the ravens that were used for reconnaissance and, uh, and, and strikes, honestly. Uh, that's where they were. But recently, in the last, easily in the last five to 10 years, they become much more accessible to the uh, everyday citizen. Right. You can purchase them off the shelf now and a reasonably, actually a very good system, you can purchase for under $1,000 and pretty much fly it out of the box right now. So as they become more commonplace, uh, I think that negative connotation is going away. But the pervasiveness throughout society now is making them, you know, the, the, 
perceived threat from a law enforcement now is, is heightened because of the pervasiveness and sure. just the sheer amount of UASs that are out in the uh, public sector right now. Sure. So let's talk about unmanned aerial vehicles specifically and talk about, from your perspective, what are the good things they can be used for? Sure. So um, engineering, for, for an engineering firm, uh, it's it's a no-brainer on some of these uses. It's, it's basically, it's a sensor. It's a remote sensor that could be um, used to monitor uh, engineering projects. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking at landfill projects, you can measure landfills. Using these, uh, using these aircraft. So if we're looking at a construction site on a day-by-day basis, a huge construction project, they're using them to go, they put the drone up every day and monitor what's going on at the site. You can do volumetric measurements on, let's say, a landfill or a, uh, a debris pile. See if that debris pile, what's the rate of movement on it to monitor the construction process. You can monitor the activity that's going on. From a project management standpoint, think about having a uh, eyes in the sky view of your project every day for next to nothing. You put a bird, you know, you put a UAS up in the air for five minutes a day and you've got a holistic picture of your your project. That's just one of them. Um, We can look at the um, health of crops. So think about uh, older systems that were maybe on satellites or were on um, aircraft, fixed wing aircraft, airplanes, right? Um, to get imagery in the old days, when I say old days, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you had to literally book a flight and it cost tens and tens of thousands of dollars to fly aerial imagery for a site. You had to get the entire aircraft to do it and post-correct the data. You had to do the full cycle to get updated imagery. And sometimes it would take years, you know, on uh, products to to get good imagery, especially in some remote areas of the uh, country or the world. Nowadays, you can literally pull a system up, fly it 10 minutes at a multi-acre site and have very precise imagery, uh, base map imagery that we use as our basis for, say, a a geographic information system, you can literally do that within an hour now and have it, you know, sub-inch or inch resolution and have it highly precise. So they really can take the place of a human being because uh, in the past... For to do some of the things, and, and not with satellites or, or things like that, but for for certain things, a, a human being would have to do it. Maybe climb up on a on a tower to see sure. see if there's anything wrong with a, a, a electrical device or something like that. Now you can do it in half the time and not have to risk the safety of a person climbing up a, a, a you know a 200 foot tower. Well, and, and that's a very good point. So, and water tank inspections. Okay, a lot of the uh, infrastructure in the country and around the world is aging. Okay, we built a lot of this infrastructure. Uh, when there's rapid expansion in the post-war era, and water tanks are aging, quite honestly. Um, before, it would take a company a lot of manpower, a lot of time to go up and inspect these tanks right now, both outside and inside. Nowadays, before we send the person, I'm not sure they'll ever fully take the place of a person, but before we put a person up there, we can use a UAS or UAV uh, to go and inspect that before the individual risks their health climbing up a rusty ladder yeah, on a right. you know 150 foot water tower right now. Right. So as we do that type of work, as as agencies, engineering firms do that, they're using that almost as a precursor to the human element to go and check for the safety of the human uh, who will be climbing that possibly rusty tower where the bolts might be missing, where there might be you know fatigue cracks in a structure. Um, and I'm not sure you're ever going to fully get rid of that, but it does make the job a lot more efficient, a lot more safer. It narrows what that human may have to go inspect. Sure. And that makes perfect sense. I think that's a great use of them. But let's talk about this. So I can't just pull a UAV out of a box and, and start using it unless I'm a hobbyist, but to be able to use it on the job, to be able to use it in law enforcement, there's got to be some requirements. Can you talk about those? Sure. So as a, as a very germane example of what we're talking about, um, I had some work done on my chimney a couple weeks ago. My chimney is very tall. So I, it's a tall colonial house. And how was I to know that my, my worker was doing a good job on it or did what he said he did? So I pulled out my personal uh, UAV. I have a little, you know, under $1,000 personal one that quite honestly my kids can fly it's so easy to, to use and I went up and I inspected my chimney with it to make sure that the uh, that my worker did what he said he did he incidentally did a great job did more than I expected but I had very high resolution imagery mm-hmm. of what he did without risking my you know my neck on a ladder quite honestly that I'm not com- I'm not used to working on heights and I don't get up there often quite frankly I'm out of shape <laughs> I might break my neck on that so 
very quickly, I fired up my UAS, my, my little um, personal UAS, went up there, took high resolution photos and said, great, good job. That, now, to do that, that was as me as a hobbyist, as a person, I was not doing it for profit or for commercial purposes. Now, what the FAA, the Federal uh, uh, Aviation Administration has is they have what's called a Part 107 certification, which is a uh, single, uh, a, an operator's license to operate a small UAS, small meaning under 55 pounds. So this certificate, um, it's a test. It's given at a number of locations, not just FAA facilities, but certified facilities around the country. And you take your exam to uh, obtain your uh, remote pilot, uh, your remote pilot's uh, certificate so that you can operate these aircraft for profit uh, in the commercial sector. Now, that also includes um, law enforcement first responders. So they can operate under a Part 107 license and um, actually do this for work. And there's a lot of rules that are involved with obtaining that license and a lot of responsibilities that the operator takes on when they obtain that license, just like you would a driver's license for a vehicle. Sure. Well, what if, so a police department wants to use it um, in the performance of their, their duties. Um, they're not using it to make money. They're not using it as a per se, a business inspecting water tanks or something like that. Mm -hmm. Why do they still have to have a Part 107? So the same reason they would um, have to have a driver's license to operate a police vehicle, right? You're using government equipment and you have to be tested and certified on that. You would not have a law enforcement uh, agent or uh, police officer driving a vehicle if they weren't uh, didn't have a, dri a valid driver's license. Sure. So in the same sense, you have to know the rules, follow the rules, and by taking that test, you certify and you hold yourself to those rules that you're going to follow the, uh, the law as it is uh, told by the FAA. Sure. So let's talk about some of those rules. Let's say I get my Part 107 certificate. Um, what are some rules or some critical rules that I need to follow? Sure. Um, so some of the basic ones are that you're going to operate in the correct airspace, that you're going to only operate in the airspace you're allowed to operate in. Uh, you're going to operate within uh, a 400-foot ceiling. Mm -hmm. You're not going to operate the unmanned aerial system at night. You're not going to go beyond line of sight, meaning you have to keep the aircraft in visual line of sight at uh, all times while you're operating it. You're not going to fly over people. You're going to contact the appropriate authorities when you do d decide to fly for a commercial or um, you know, a, a law enforcement or government endeavor. Okay. So I've seen um, UAVs flying around uh, high school football games, and I think there's even companies out there now from a business perspective that are, are recording them. These st stadiums during games are full of people. So, so how do they get around that? Do they get an exemption or do they just... Quite frankly, they're doing it illegally. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I've seen a number of those as well. I have know some individuals, not tied to through work or anything, who do that. And they're, quite frankly, they're breaking the law and they are putting uh, the public in danger. Any more than you would not want a um, unlicensed driver driving around on the roads, right? You wouldn't want that. And they're doing it illegally. Um, you know, honestly, it's tough to enforce these rules, though, too. Local law enforcement oftentimes doesn't understand um, the rules on this, and they, you know, it's how do you enforce that? It's an FAA rule, and it's a difficult situation because these rules have changed quite a bit, too, and they are so pervasive. These, you can, anybody can go buy one of these things and um, operate these, you know, relatively um, inexpensive but high performing uh, pieces of machinery. So right. when you see them in a football game, when you see them over a parade, they shouldn't be doing that. They really should not be doing that. There's no reason to <laughs> fly over uh, the public right. uh, as a, as a hobbyist. What about airports? Now I know there's rules um, about flying them near airports. I think that's so you can strictly prohibited. Sure, they're prohibited. You can get uh, waivers for those. Okay. It's like it's a COA. Uh, you can get a waiver from the FAA to do that. It's a lengthy process. Um, but you do have to notify air, uh, airports within five miles of your flights if you're doing that. And some of the more uh, restricted airspaces, you have to go through um, some more stringent uh, processes to actually have the ability to fly. It's not impossible, but it's carefully monitored. And the um, FAA will uh, cl closely monitor what you're doing around airports for the obvious reasons because yeah. it's putting, uh, it's putting air, air, aircraft, uh, you know, civilian and commercial aircraft in jeopardy if you do that. 
So, Joe, the the FAA they regulate airspace. Yes, they re- they regulate uh, the, all the class A, B, C, uh, G airspaces around airports around uh, the country, except for restricted airspace. Restricted airspaces are generally military bases and other areas that uh, don't fall under the FAA's uh, domain. So, what about the? Um the uses of UAVs, specifically in public safety. Can you talk about it from your perspective? What is the importance of it? What can it do? What should we be thinking about UAVs for the future in relation to public safety? Sure. So um, I think about this often and the uses that uh, the government can have in public safety. So first and foremost, I think it's a uh, it's a force multiplier. It gives us eyes in the sky, um, oversight when... Um, at previous times, in previous years, you would have to wait for imagery. So it gives us a good, uh, quick, common knowledge of the um, of our AOR, of our areas of responsibility. So if there's a fire, or if there's a standoff, potential uh, hostage standoff, if there's a disaster, okay, very quickly, um, law enforcement, first responders, and decision makers have. Uh, an instant view of what's really going on on the ground or in as near real time as you're possibly going to get these days. So it allows uh, for, as a false force multiplier, it allows these agencies to have a much more timely view of what's actually going on. Now, that being said, um, it's it's both retroactively um, useful if we've got historical imagery of, let's say, a chemical facility or a high school, if you know what it looked like three weeks ago. And then you compare during an actual emergency and then post-emergency or post-event. Think about Houston, okay? We had good imagery of Houston beforehand. They keep, you know, regular imagery. But during the event, during the hurricane that hit there, um, UASs were put up in the air to see the extent of the damage. Obviously, it wasn't during the event. It was way too um, the the conditions were way too bad to be flying UAS uh, aircraft in that system. But immediately after, you can start using that imagery to assess damage, to start thinking about where you're going to set up relief shelters, to think about ingress and egress into a potentially um, hazardous area, whether it be from downed electrical lines or people who are stranded in you know neighborhoods. How do you ingress ingress and egress. And all of a sudden, you've got views that you could have never had in the past without the use of these. I mean, it's instant imagery almost. Yeah. And the cameras on these devices are incredible, right? You want to talk about that? They're wonderful. I mean, you can get some very high resolution imagery. They're using them for cinema photography uh, these days. Some of the heavier lift ones can literally lift up movie cameras. And they're replacing helicopters for... um, for movies, quite honestly, um, some of the more the hobby grade one, mine on my little you know seven hundred dollar aircraft, it does a wonderful. It's a wonderful camera. It's you know I get wonderful quality uh, imagery off my shots. Again, I can see my chimney. I can see what my uh, what my worker uh, replaced on the chimney. How good a job he did. But you know you're flying up three hundred ninety nine feet in the air. You're getting a good uh, survey of an area. You're going to know where there's flooding. You're going to know where there's downed electrical lines. You can get that through still pictures, still imagery, or you can get that through video. Um, And there's an increasingly uh, advanced ways that we can telemeter that data to the decision makers back at, you know, so you have people in the field actually operating the aircraft, taking pictures of the imagery or streaming, you know, taking video, but now we can stream it. We can send that video, those stills back in near real time. So people at an op center, people who need to know this stuff are having information quicker than they've ever had it before. Yeah, they can get they can get the information right away and make decisions very quickly. That, that's a great use of the UAVs for sure. So Joe, I was talking to someone who was taking our introduction to UAV class, who was working for uh, uh, one of the uh, forest preserves in the Chicagoland area. And he was telling me that there's a lot of uses for them. Um, search and rescue, someone gets lost in the woods or looking for, for squatters and, and, and things like that that, that happen sometimes to, to, to live in the woods. Um, what can some people do in that regard in terms of a search and rescue with someone maybe is lost in the woods and let's just say it's at night and you're not able to fly them at night? Are there, are there something that can be used to identify um, people with special cameras? Sure. So um, too often times people think of a, uh, a UAS, a UAV, as having a, uh, a visual camera on it. And most of the times that's uh, what they're used for, honestly. You get them out of the box, they've got the camera, they've got a GoPro type camera, the little um, 
cameras on them that give us really nice uh, EO imagery. But um, a lot of times what the more advanced users or the more commercial professional users do is they put different types of sensors on these. They can put um, IR sen infrared sensors on these. They can put thermal sensors on these. They can put multi-spec hyperspectral sensors wow. on these aircraft that can literally see things that the human eye can't see. So if I had a uh, aircraft, one of the great examples, we had, um, we were uh, flying these uh, at a, uh, a military base and we have this aircraft up in the air and we're looking around it's still daylight we switched to an infrared camera and you saw really an incredible amount of wildlife in the forest you know there was a pack of deer and off in the forest we also saw a pack of wolves wow. <laughs> and you could see these things moving in and you know our eyes couldn't see that and this right. was quite a distance away but we could see the thermal signatures the infrared signatures on these uh uh, critters in the forest, and it's it's amazing. It's almost like night vision goggles. And that sounds exactly like what uh, the the forest preserve police would be able to use because it's very dense forest. You can't see through it. The infrared would be incredibly useful in something like that. Oh yeah, and you think about the uh, challenges they're facing: large amounts of open land that's not navig navigable necessarily. Um, how does Two rangers cover, you know, hundreds of acres. You're not going to be able to do that in one sitting. And if you do, it's going to be, you know, hard to navigate. So it seems like a perfect use uh, for a forest preserve district or anything with really large open expanses of land to cover a lot of ground from, you know, from the air quickly mm -hmm. and then literally seeing in the dark with these if you needed to, if you had the right exemptions from the FAA to say fly at night right. or even using those, you know, those type of cameras during the day. They're obviously not as effective. A thermal camera during the day is not as effective as at night with the yeah. temper, temperature differential, but right. you can still use that. You can also see your, you know, not only um, the subject you're looking for, but where are your search teams? I mean, where are you, you know, if you're making a line and walk in the woods, you know, you do that and then you map out, you know, where this is where the GIS part comes in. You map out what grid you've searched and what you've already covered. Yeah, so. I think I, that's tremendous use of these. And I could see the, the value in that. So what do you think about the, the, the future use of UAVs just in relationship to, you know, business use? I mean, are we going to see... Uh, Pizzas being delivered using UAVs. <laughs> if I wanted to order a hot dog from the Wiener Circle, can I use a UAV to get I me? Mean, what are some out of the box type businesses that would be created with the use of UAVs? So, so this is Tom, this is just my personal view on this. I don't see um, package delivery <laughs> with with uh, unmanned aerial systems, quite honestly, uh, anytime soon. Because, well, quite honestly, right now it's not uh, economically feasible to do this. With the battery life is a shortcoming of the uh, UASs. Yeah. You know, you'd have to continually be tending that. Um, that aircraft, you'd have to keep it in range, and it would probably take as much or more operator assistance and operator care than it would be just to deliver the package, quite honestly. How long does a battery last, Joe? Oh, that's a good question. That's the million, literally the $20 million question is uh, battery life on these things, because that's usually the limiting factor is battery life. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen anywhere from literally um, eight to 10 minutes on some aircraft that are heavy lift uh, up to, you know, anywhere on the rotary aircraft, 45 minutes to 50 minutes on some of the better it's ones. It's not a lot of time. It's really not. And that's one of the challenges that pose, that is posed, I think, to law enforcement and first responder agencies is if you're going to rely on these uh, aircraft for, you know, eyes in the sky and surveillance, you start depending on that. And some of these aircraft, let's face it, are expensive when you get up into the higher end aircraft. So you put one aircraft up in the air to monitor, let's say a hazmat situation, and your command staff and structure is using that to um, guide their field operations. You can't just bring that aircraft down because the battery's running out and leave yourself blind for God knows how, you know, goodness knows how long you um, don't have eyes in the sky. You're gonna have to put a second aircraft up overlapping mm. and so all of a sudden now when you think you only needed one aircraft one pilot now all of a sudden you need two aircraft two pilots a visual observer if that's in your standard operating procedures and all of a sudden the operation gets expensive and a little bit trickier and a little bit more coordinated than you think because once you start doing that and depend on it the operation is not going to stop because you got to change a battery and my guess is as these uh progress and they're you know we get into the future and they're more sophisticated I'm guessing battery life will end up being extended at some point. I would hope so. Yeah. I mean, you'd think just like 
the evolution of laptop computers, mobile phones. I mean, think how long your first mobile phone uh, is battery lasted, the coverage and the uses. It's evolved quickly. Um, and I think a lot of that is going to be dependent on the way these FAA rulings go, quite honestly. They opened up the use of these commercially. Um, it, it opened up a floodgate when they had the Part 107 rule come in uh, a couple years ago or two years ago. Um, now all of a sudden a company, a commercial entity, has a viable way to actually utilize these aircraft. Um, whereas before it was an arduous, a bit of an arduous process to get an exemption from the FAA through a COA, um, now it's relatively easy for people to take the test, you know, kind of have some working knowledge of this and put the aircraft up in the air and use it. And I think that's where you're going to start seeing both on the law enforcement side um, these entities having to deal with both the constructive uses of UASs on their own, you know, for you know, for force as a force multiplier, but additionally having to look out for the number of drones that are flying over a parade in downtown Chicago, flying yeah. through, you know, near an airport. You saw in New York a couple of weeks ago, a black an army black hawk helicopter got hit by one of these, mm -hmm. damaged the rotor, and it's you know, at the same time you're using them to maintain your situational awareness, but it's part of your situational awareness domain as well. Right. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. It's a good technology in some sense, but it also poses a potential threat as sure. well. Sure, that makes sense. So, Joe, tell us about some of the things being offered and, and what the plans are for the program here at the College of DuPage. And in, in terms of your viewpoint moving forward with the program, what do you, what do you see out of the program here? So what I like about what we've started here at the College of DuPage is that we've engaged law enforcement and first responders in the use of these. I think um, it's a bit mysterious to some of the um, operators or people in agencies who want to utilize these in their day-to-day -day activities. And I think what we did was demystify a lot of the use of these and give them a very practical first-step approach towards first getting their uh, Part 107 license. And then secondly, um, collaborating and working with these agencies to come up with uh, standard operating procedures. You know, I've never been a law enforcement officer. I was military. And in fact, I was a uh, I was in an infantry scout platoon. So I saw instant use for these things as, you know, it's would take over my job, hopefully, mm -hmm. someday, because hopefully people won't be going out and doing scout duties. They'll have these machines doing it for them. But in the law enforcement sense, I think they evolved and they're thinking over the course of the week class we had to collaborating and thinking. Um, great example of this is one of our um, officers was talking about uses of these. And if he was approaching a house or a suspect's house or any situation, said he would take out the, um, and these are smaller UASs too. They're not very big. Mm -hmm. Some of these newer ones can fit in a cargo pants pocket. Said he would take it out, turn it on, put it on top of his uh, vehicle, not fly it, Turn it on so the camera's operating. Okay, mm -hmm. so he's maybe monitoring his UAS video feed, or not monitoring, but has it on his uh, cell phone. So as he approaches a uh, a situation, it's on, it's available if he needs it. If something happens and you have to take cover and you don't have the ability, maybe you don't want to put your head up. Well, all of a sudden, it's on your vehicle, looking at the same. So it's kind of covering your back in a visual manner. And if you had to, and if something happened where you had to put that aircraft up in the air, you can do it right there, watching it, put it up in the air and see somebody, you know, is there a weapon? Is there somebody else in the area who might be taking aim at you or something like mm -hmm. that? So we, we evolved our thinking during that class and law enforcement shared ideas in ways that our pilots and our instructors couldn't have possibly thought of because we don't do this every day. So it was a nice collaboration we did there. And I think what we saw in, your, in the class, Tom, to answer your question, was we saw an evolution from teaching people the rules to actually flying, to flying tactically and to thinking about this before you just go out and fly. So um, where I think the college could potentially help out these agencies is helping them develop curriculum that centers around standard operating procedures, how you're going to do this safely, what the mission is going to be. Not just going out and flying these because you can, but going out and flying them with a purpose and a mission and a way to integrate it into your everyday operations to get right. good at it. That's great. Great points for sure. We do offer classes here at the College of DuPage, and we have an introductory or introduction to UAV class coming up. Um, at the end of October, we had one recently, and we have uh, two more after that scheduled for the fall. So if anyone's interested, they can go to www.cod.edu backslash HSTI, 
and get a list and, and information on all the classes we have coming up on UAVs. It's a, it's a fascinating area. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for coming on today. Wonderful information. And, and I'm really appreciative that you were able to come in and kind of break this down. For people who don't know much about this, like like myself, you know, I, I, I have a much better understanding and, and I can see the use the valuable uses of these things for the future. So I want to thank you for coming in. Well, thanks, Tom, for having me. It's a pleasure, and it's a, it's an exciting new field, and I'm glad that the college is uh, getting into this at an early uh, stage. Fantastic. That's Joe Adusi, and this is Tom Brady. So we're signing off until next time on the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. We'll see you later, and stay safe. Stay safe.